I have been and remain an advocate of simple roast turkey with gravy, but this is a more involved approach that I've been wanting to try for a while. I fully deboned this turkey before roasting it, and I used the bones to make a turkey demi-glace, which is delicious. What I like about this method is all the hard work is done in advance. On the day of your big holiday feast, all you do is throw a pan in the oven, and slicing up boneless meat could not be easier. The sauce you just reheat, you're done. I'd suggest starting two days out from said feast, though you could start the day before. This is a big turkey, 20 pounds, 9 kilos, but you can do this with any size bird. And I'll get some kitchen scissors and my boning knife, but you could use any really sharp knife. Flip the bird around so that you're looking at its backbone. There are only four places where the skeleton protrudes up through the meat. The shoulder joints there, and the hip joints down here here. Other than those four points, all the meat is just sitting on top of the bones. So all you have to do is peel it off. I've cut straight down along one side of the spine. Now I'll just let my knife follow the bones and you can feel them super easy. Just slowly peel the meat off of that central skeleton. And I've hit my first joint, the hip joint there. Lots of people have lots of ways of getting through the joints. Here's my crude but easy approach. Grab kitchen scissors, get them around the joint, grip down and then twist hard. Just kind of lever that joint around until you start to dislocate it. When you open it up a bit, you can get in with your scissors and start snipping away at the ligaments and other stuff connecting that femur to the pelvic girdle. I'm through, and that whole hip and leg quarter is now free. Up here, I've hit the shoulder joint, and I'll do the exact same thing. Get my scissors around the joint, twist to lever it apart a bit, and then I can snip or cut the ligaments attaching the humerus to the scapula. Both joints on this side are now cut, so I am free and clear. I can just keep peeling meat off of the ribs one little slice at a time, following the bones with my knife. We're cutting the breast meat off now, and I'm going to stop when I reach the very bottom, which will be the sternum, the breastbone. That half of the bird is now free. So I can keep using my dominant hand. I'll simply rotate the bird to do the other side. Yes, I'm doing this directly on my counter. I'm going to have to spray down this counter no matter what I do, so I figure there's no point in trying to do this on a little cutting board. Everything is going to spill out anyway. Again, I'm just peeling the meat off the backbone until I hit a joint and I can't go any further. There's the other hip joint. I can feel it even though I can't see it. I'll just get in with my scissors, grab the joint, and twist to dislocate it. If you do not yet have basic knowledge of bird anatomy, I would not recommend doing this. Break down a few whole chickens, cooked and raw, before you attempt anything ambitious as this. I'm through the hip and now I can peel off the rest of the leg quarter real easy. One more joint to go. And honestly, the wing or shoulder joint here is small enough, even on a big turkey, that you can dislocate it by hand. This is how I normally do all the joints on a chicken. Just pop the joint, and now that it's loose, you can easily get your knife in there and cut through any tissue still holding the joint together. Start peeling that breast meat off of the ribs and the breastbone, and now the British and French sides of the channel have converged. Just peel the meat off the sternum there, maybe just break off the wishbone, and the central skeleton or carcass is free. I'll just put that over here with the neck and the giblets, all great stuff for the gravy or demi-glace. There are a few bits of cartilage still hanging out around where the breastbone was. I'll trim those out. Next challenge is to get the leg and thigh bones out. First, just cut straight down to the thigh bone and then peel some meat off the sides. Then I'll slip my knife in and under. Oops, that's actually facing the wrong way. Get the knife facing out and then saw out toward where the hip was. That end of the femur is now free. Same process on the knee and the shin bone there, the tibia. Just cut straight down across the length of it and then start to peel meat off the sides until you can see what you're doing. Now I think I'll just grab the hip bone and start sawing underneath the knee, peeling that off, peeling the tibia off the meat underneath. And then once I get down around the ankle, I'll just lever those bones over and the scissors make it real easy to snip all that off. Save that for the sauce. What's left are these tendons that are so huge on a big turkey. They're like little bones. They make most of the turkey leg virtually inedible, but with this method, we can pull them out. I wish I could say you can grab them with a paper towel or your scissors, but honestly, pliers are the tool for the job. Grab the tendon by the end, hold the meat back with your other hand, and pull hard. You can pull all those out like porcupine needles, save for sauce. Same over here, saw out under the femur, that's free. Cut down along the knee and the tibia, peel some meat off the sides, grab the thigh bone, get under with the knife, and 
saw out toward the ankle. Scissors are great for snipping where those tendons join up down near the ankle. Bones are free. Use the pliers to pull out the tendons. The wings, honestly, you could just cut off whole and throw them in with the sauce. There's not much great meat on them. I am deboning the upper portion by just cutting straight down along the humerus and peeling the meat off the sides. In chicken wing terminology, this is the drumette. That's some good meat. I'll slip my knife under the bone and saw out the winglets I'm not going to bother fighting for, and certainly not the wing tip at the end. All of that will just cut off whole and save for the sauce. Now I'll just look around for anything left that I don't want to eat. Any little bits of cartilage hanging around, any super blubbery globs of fat. If I'm going to go through all this work, I want the roast that I have left to be 100% edible. And all these trimmings are great for sauce. Last thing is I'll just flip back these pectoralis minor muscles, also known as the poultry tenderloin. Just fold them out and the meat will sit at a much more even thickness. To that same end, I'll butterfly the thickest part of the breast a little bit, just one or two shallow cuts to that thick part to get it to lie a little flatter so that it will cook in the same time as the rest. I know this looks like a failed experimental surgery right now, but just wait till it's cooked. We're done. Whew, let's take a break. Maybe I'll scan my grocery receipt with Fetch Rewards, the sponsor of this video. We all tend to spend a lot of money around the holidays, but you can get reward points back on all retail receipts, not just groceries or restaurants. Here's a bookstore receipt. You just take a picture of it with the free Fetch Rewards app, hit submit, and get points back immediately. You can also hit the e-receipt button, and it'll scan your email inbox for any eligible receipts. I spend most of my money online, so no surprise I get a lot more points points back this way. Let's see what I can get. The rewards are basically gift cards that you can spend at nearly any retail store or food chain you could think of, Amazon. I think I'll just save money on my next trip to the bookstore. Done. Download the app yourself. Just hit my link in the description. Use my code Ragusia and you'll get 3,000 points on your first receipt. That's a limited time offer just for you. Use my link and code in the description. Thanks, Fetch Rewards. Back to the scene of the crime. I'm not the biggest fan of this, but with everything wide open here, it would be very easy to do a quick salt cure or dry brine on this meat. Just put on as much salt as you would normally use to flavor this much meat. No more, no less. Might as well put on some other seasonings while we're here. Lots of pepper and maybe some herbs, dried thyme and sage, classic for the holiday. And also nice on this side would be some garlic powder and onion powder. Okay, flip her around and that looks better already, doesn't it? But a 20 pound bird all flayed out like this is too big to fit on my baking tray. I could cut it in half through the breast and have two mirror images image halves, but I'm going to snip the leg quarters off. There's basically only skin attaching the breast to the thigh here, so it should be very obvious where to cut. And now I can put my dark meat on one tray and my white meat on another. That's a bonus. They cook really differently, and now we have independent control over them. Again, as much salt on the skin as you would normally use to season right before cooking, no more, no less. It's mostly going to be absorbed into the meat during the curing process. Pepper too, and I'll do some of those same herbs, but no garlic or onion powder. Those those things tend to burn under intense dry heat. They'll be protected on the underside, but not on top here. Last thing is to kind of tuck any exposed meat up under the skin. When the meat is exposed in the fridge, it goes leathery. When the skin dries out, it gets crispy and delicious. In the fridge, uncovered. The point here is to dry out the skin like they do for Peking duck. Normal food safety protocol is to put raw meat at the bottom of the fridge in case it leaks. You don't want it leaking down onto your food, but I'm pretty sure these trays are secure, and if I put them on top, my kids won't be able to reach them when they're groping around in the fridge for snacks. Them bones! And they go to my roasting tray with the neck, the skin, any trimmings. I'll cut a couple of onions in half and drop those in. In the oven at like 400 Fahrenheit, 200 C to roast and develop some brown flavor. After like half an hour, I'll squirt on a little tomato paste that will not make this tomato-y. It'll just boost the umami in the end and darken the color a bit. Then I'll flip the pieces around a little. Tomato paste on the bones is pretty common trick for demi gloss. I find that if I put it on at the very beginning, it burns. Whatever you do, don't let anything burn. Like, see, I'm starting to get a few black bits there. That's bad. With a demi gloss, all the flavors get majorly concentrated. I should have pulled this out a few minutes earlier. That was about an hour. And normally I'd transfer these into a big stock pot, but I'm going to try simmering this right here in my roasting tray. It's already dirty, and I think it'll be just big enough. The culinary school types tell you to start a stock in cold water. This is because the albumin protein found in meat does not dissolve in hot water. I don't think it makes a meaningful difference, but I am using my filtered water from the fridge because everything is going to be concentrated and the Knoxville tap water does not taste so great. Macon water was way better. I'll be able to get everything submerged as it all cooks down and softens. This is super optional, but
but for some umami boost, I'm throwing in a handful of dried porcini. Turkey gravy is often boosted with mushrooms, tastes real good. Some whole peppercorns in, and maybe bay leaves will do something in there. I doubt it. Bring that up to a boil, reduce to a simmer. I don't have a lid for this, so foil, two pieces. I'll just let that go for a couple hours, and here we are, looking good. I'll stir everything around, and things are starting to fall apart, so I can get everything submerged now. Gotta top off the water, though. To have a nice stock to make gravy, you could honestly stop right there, but I'm making demi-glace, which is thickened with gelatin, not starch, so I need to dissolve all the collagen in there into gelatin, which will take a while. I'm now about to go to bed, so I'll give it one more stir, top off the water, and make sure it's just barely bubbling. I don't want all that water to evaporate while I'm asleep, because then everything would burn. Here we are the next day. Simmering roasted bones for this long tends to throw off some pretty intense smells. Don't be dismayed if it's kind of gross at this stage. I used to do this on a hot plate outside until I got a decent kitchen exhaust system. Grab a bone, and if it breaks real easy, that's a sign you've extracted all you can. I simmered this about 16 hours. It's the day before the feast now. I'm just fishing out most of the solids. This will make it a lot easier for me to pass everything through a strainer in a sec. Before I take these to the compost, I'll pour any liquid from the bowl back in. Now I'm going to bring this to a boil and reduce it down by maybe a third, just so it's smaller and easier to deal with. Here's a cheat, a packet of unflavored gelatin. You don't have to do that. We've got plenty of gelatin in there already, but this is for a big feast. I want lots of sauce to feed lots of people, and a little extra gelatin will allow me to get that texture that I want without reducing it down quite as much. That powder tends to clump, so that's why I'm letting it boil for a while to dissolve, and then everything is going through a sieve. you got to cool this down fast and there's lots of ways to do that. Today I'm doing the huge bowl filled with ice water and the smaller bowl nested inside. Sieve on, stock goes through. I was sure to stop boiling this before it thickened up very much. At this stage, if you reduce it down too thick, a lot of it will stick to the remaining bones and such and you'll lose it. Plus, if it's too thick, the fat will not separate out as cleanly as we chill this down. It won't be able to escape and rise to the surface. You can already see that fat rising up. Stir this around, let it transfer all its heat down through that metal bowl and into the ice water. It's amazing how fast this cools down, which is good because it's a high-protein, low-sodium, low-acid solution that could be very hospitable to microbes. Ten minutes later, give it one more stir. It's barely lukewarm. I'll pull that out, cover it up because fat absorbs smells in the fridge. You could also put this in the freezer if you're in a hurry. Later that same day, here we are. The fat has surfaced and solidified, or has it? That's plenty cold, but it's still pretty liquid, which means this turkey is relatively low and saturated fat. It's not like doing this with beef, where the fat is a solid puck on top that you can just lift off. This is still pretty easy, though, because the stock underneath is a very firm block of jello. I'm not penetrating it at all as I scrape the fat off the top. That's plenty clean. And now you could totally just make the world's best gravy by frying an equal quantity of flour in this fat to make a roux, let it brown a bit, stir in the stock, boil until thick, and you're done. But I'm not doing that this time. I'm going to save this fat for a thing. This meaty jello I will transfer to my widest pan, or at least as much of it as I can fit in there. I'm not making that mistake twice. Get that boiling down and concentrating until syrupy. A meat glaze this concentrated cannot hold fat inside itself without a lot of emulsifying help, so that's why we had to get all the fat out to make demi-glass. Now I can fit in the rest without any danger of this boiling over. You don't have to stir this constantly until it starts to get really syrupy. Then you gotta move it. Stuff could stick to the bottom or the sides and burn. That's looking very nice, tasting very nice. I think I'm going to put like a glass of white wine in there. I think that'll brighten this up, give it some floral notes that'll be very festive, and the sweetness will be nice, but really, really stir. Or do this at a lower temperature for a much longer time. It'd be a tragedy to burn it, and there's lots of sugar in there now, and that sugar burns. A gelatin-thickened sauce like this will be much thicker at eating temperature, so when you think you're close, you might want to turn the heat off a bit and then assess. I'd say that's looking just right. Time to season. There's no salt in in this yet, other than the salts that were naturally in the animal. This is hilarious. It is so glossy that my camera cannot focus on it. Then you can just scrape all that into a bowl, chill, and reheat tomorrow. Tomorrow is today, the big feast. All you do is pull the trays out of the fridge. After 48 hours, the skin is really dry and most of the salt has been absorbed deep into the meat, which is good if you're into that. 400 Fahrenheit, 200 C, I will stop and baste the skin once or twice. If you want crazy crispy skin, do not baste. Just rub the skin down with oil before you put it in the oven and never touch it again. There's some water in these basting juices that'll reduce our final crispiness just a little bit, but I think the flavor will be better, so that's a trade-off I 
I am comfortable with. If this turkey was on the bone, it would take five hours at least. Off the bone, it's been just over an hour and the white meat is almost done. The dark meat is done. Normally dark meat takes longer than white meat, but off the bone, the pieces are way smaller, there's more surface area, so that's already at 185 Fahrenheit, 85 C, and that's my preferred internal temp for dark meat. You can cook it a little bit less. White meat, you definitely don't want to take past 160 Fahrenheit, 71 C. Carryover heat will easily take it a few degrees further into what they say are the minimum safe temperatures. As it rests, I might put the dark meat back in the oven just to warm it back up again. If you want more color, just jack the heat way up at the very end. But I think turkey tastes best when it's kind of blonde. So there's everything. Enough meat for a dozen people, at least. If this were gravy, that wouldn't be nearly enough sauce. But this glaze is far more intense than gravy, so you don't need as much. However, if you want more sauce volume, you could stir in a bunch of butter at the last minute. As long as the heat is really low, nothing is bubbling, you should be able to melt this in without breaking the the natural emulsion of the butter. People often finish demi-glace based sauces with butter. It works great. If anything, it makes the flavor much more delicious. It changes the texture. It maybe makes it a little warmer or fluffier on the palate. That's the only way I can think to describe it. The pure demi is just more glazy. I actually set aside half of my demi to keep it pure. You're only looking at the other half right now. And by slowly melting in butter, I've nearly doubled my sauce volume, which is great for a big family meal. Give that a taste and re-season, especially if you used unsalted butter. Here's half of that breast ready to slice, and Lauren is always the skin thief. <laughs> That's so good. Indeed, the salt cure and the air drying have made that skin incredibly crisp and tasty. And here's the best part of this whole deal. I can just slice this up on the board. It's not up in the air, stuck on top of a giant rib cage. There's no bones to work around, nothing inedible. It could not be easier. On the day of, this is so much less stress than a conventional turkey dinner. And the difference is even more dramatic on this dark meat. Normally, the skin on the dark meat is soggy because it was down on the bottom, submerged in juice. This is so crisp. And normally, you can can slice hardly any meat off of the leg because of those bony tendons. Every slice here is totally clean, totally edible, and cooked way hotter than the white meat, which is the way that I think it's best. You might want to let everybody know that they should go easy on the sauce. It's way stronger than gravy. And since the skin is so crispy, it's nice that we don't have to wet it all down with sauce. Now, I will tell you that I am not a fan of brined turkey meat. A wet brine gives it the texture of cheap bologna. A dry brine like we did here makes the texture a little too firm for me. And I think the uniform saltiness provided by either one kind of drowns out the subtle flavor of turkey. I prefer to have my sauce bring the salt. And if I were to do this again, I would do it the exact same way, but I would not salt the turkey in advance. Maybe I'd salt the skin a little bit to help it dry, but I'd season conventionally right before the oven. That said, maybe I'm crazy. Everybody else seems to love poultry brines, so you do you. And don't forget side dishes. I've got a few linked in the description. And if you follow this method, you'll have a lot more time and brain space on the day of your feast to cook those side dishes. Or you can make your family cook them. I mean, you deboned a whole damn turkey. Haven't you done enough? Somebody give you a beer.